Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Wilson, president of Morgan State University here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Morgan is Maryland's largest uh, HBCU, historically black college or university. Uh, we are a high research university, uh, having been in existence since 1867, more than 150 years ago. Uh, you know, um, there was a huge debate that raged here in Maryland 150 years ago, uh, and it was around whether uh, blacks actually should uh, received uh, liberal arts degrees. Um, there was this uh, notion uh, that um, African Americans did not possess the intellectual ability or the rigor uh, to actually pursue those degrees. Uh, but uh, the founders of Morgan State University, those visionary founders, did not accept that notion. Uh, they saw a future of learning, a future of skill, and a future of work that included all of Americans in all disciplines not just the privileged few. And so today, uh, much like, believe it or not, 150 years ago or so, uh, we find that um, visionaries like the founders of uh, Morgan uh, brought into existence so many institutions with that same kind of mindset. And now we are all but overwhelmed by the urgent need to think like that again. Yes, uh, so many of you like me uh, were interrupted by the announcement of the discovery of the Omicron variant uh, to state that the world was caught off guard and simply unprepared for the arrival of COVID is a vast understatement. But you know, uh, educational systems were simply not prepared. Institutions were equally unprepared for the swift transition to online and remote environments. As an HBCU president, uh, I am so grieved by the impact that COVID has had on public schools which largely serve poor minority communities, uh, many of those communities from which we draw students. And those schools are already under-resourced even prior to COVID. And so now those students who have been without this kind of face-to-face -face rigorous learning for two years, uh, how would these students perform academically for generations to come? How would these students develop socially? How would they catch up uh, after these two years of inconsistent touch and go instruction? Oh yes. Uh, how will we ensure that these students are equipped with the skills that they need to enable this nation to be ever so competitive? Uh, and so uh, I would just like to close my remarks about taking us, if you will, to 2050. You know, 2050 is only uh, 31 years or so um, away, uh, 30 years or so away. Um, and um, when we look at 2050, um, we have to ask ourselves some big questions. Uh, and those questions are, uh, what would this nation look like? Well, uh, one thing is certain, uh, our nation will be much, much more diverse uh, than it is now. Uh, and we look around and we see the type of innovation that is currently taking place. We see the type of research that is currently taking place. And there are all kinds of predictions that are looming large for 2050. Uh, predictions like quantum computing, for example, that it will power all of our uh, computerizations uh, from data analytics to digital uh, entertainment. Um, even our food supplies are, are predicted to be stabilized by 3D printed meats and robot harvested crops. Um, and even the development of robots uh, is taken on you know, such um, proliferation that um, the research has shown that robots could almost by 2030 um, have human-like functions. And so uh, as we look at 2050, I think it is critical for us to ensure that um, we are educating all of our populations uh, with the degrees that they need, with the skills that they need, uh, so that they are in alignment with the work of the future and the future of work. We need to make sure that disciplines like cloud computing and embedded systems and cybersecurity, internet of things, uh, that um, these disciplines um, and the skills that come out of them uh, are being reached um, uh, or, or actually being, being embraced uh, by all of the population. I think that if we don't pay very careful attention, much like the visionary founders of Morgan and other institutions like it did 150 years ago, to ensuring that all of America is equipped with the tools that they need to help this country be competitive, we will not have the innovators in 2050 to lead the world as we do today. This to me is our great calling.
Thank you. Good afternoon. Deborah Wynn Smith, delighted to welcome you all for this very exciting discussion on the future of learning skills and work. I want to thank you, Dr. Wilson, for framing this very important dialogue that's so critical to the future of U.S. competitiveness and prosperity. I'm delighted that this session is going to be moderated by the Council's Executive Vice President, Bill Bates. And again, very pleased to welcome Ms. Randy Weingarten, the President of the American Federation of Teachers, AFL-CIO. Randy's a longstanding member of the Council's Executive Committee. Thank you, Randy, for, for your tremendous leadership. And I'm very excited also to welcome Ms. Janet Fauti, the Executive Chair of the Board for Deloitte U.S. and one of our distinguished commissioners of the Council's National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers. I'm very excited as well to announce and share with all of you today on behalf of the Council's Board of Directors that our Executive Committee has formally elected Janet to serve as our next Vice Chair for Business. Janet, we look forward to continuing our deep work with you and the entire team at Deloitte for supporting the mission and the initiatives of the Council on Competitiveness to advance competitiveness for all of our citizens and our leadership in the world. Thank you so much and let's go forward with a great discussion. Good afternoon. This is Bill Bates, Executive Vice President with the Council on Competitiveness. I'm excited now to continue our conversation on the future of learning, skills, and work. I am honored to be joined by two of our executive committee members, Janet Foudy, the executive chair of the board at Deloitte US. Janet is also a member of our National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers. And Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, AFL-CIO. Janet, Randy, thank you so much for being with us today. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I want to jump right into our first question, if I could. What do each of you see as some of the critical emerging skills that are needed for students and workers for the jobs that our current economy is creating? And Janet, if I could turn to you first. Excellent. Thanks so much, Bill. And it's great to be here with you and Randy today. I want to start with the frame that I think is from a business perspective and an industry perspective is the most important, which is that the pursuit of technical excellence alone mm -hmm. is really no longer enough. We certainly have seen through almost every dimension of our society that the uncertainty of the future with emerging technology means workers really need a mindset of both constant curiosity and this what's next mindset. So organizations, education systems, and government have a critical role to play in this developing talent um, and this mindset shift that's so critical. From my perspective as a leader of a professional services organization, and we do think of ourselves as a great incubator of talent, I do believe that business has a really important role to play in deep collaboration with the broader ecosystem of both education um, and government and more broadly. There's two things in our human capital trends report, our 2021 human capital trends report that I wanted to just share very briefly. The first is that organizations will be able to thrive in uncertain futures, will design work in ways that engage workers. And that really has not been at the centerpiece of how organizations have thought about work. And the second is that we believe a movement towards worker empowerment is really needed to unlash potential and build resilience. And that is all rooted in adaptability, reskilling, and new roles as some of the most important things that we continue to hear from executives and from our clients in terms of the things that are the most important. So that's my really quick spin through, and I'm really looking forward to what Randy has to say on this important <laughs> question. Janet, I think you've just said, you know, what I would actually have said about it. People need voice. People need agency. Um, so, you know, the skills, you know, and I started as a social studies teacher, and I'm really glad to be here with you, with you, Bill, and with you, Janet. So I started as a social studies teacher, high school social studies teacher. So I'm always thinking about how kids have confidence, um, confidence to learn, confidence to be able to get up if, after they failed, if they failed. So confidence, resilience, critical thinking life skills, the, the sense of curiosity, of ingenuity, of wanting to learn more, wanting to figure it out. So 
these kind of critical thinking, life skills, confidence, curiosity, how do we make school joyous and interesting so that somebody wants to come back over and over again? So project-based instruction, career technical education, all of these things teach critical thinking, teach confidence, teach life skills, and the resilience that Janet just talked about. But the glue is how you make sure that people have agency and empowerment. And, and frankly, that's part of the reason why I think unions are on the ascendancy again and why um, uh, workers actually really want unions because they wanna make sure that they have a process by which to have that kind of empowerment and voice that, that Janet was talking about. Well, I guess just, and, and Bill, we'll give it back to you in a moment. I know we've got a little bit of time here, but Randy, what you want for your students is exactly what we want in corporate America and in government in terms of mindset and critical thinking. So I, exactly. I couldn't be delighted to hear sort of how much intersection there was between how we've been thinking about this. And I know you have another question, Bill, but I think it's really important for business and, and, and public education to work together. The apprenticeship programs that you have in the trades kind of put all this together. But take a school like P-Tech or take other career tech schools or other partnerships with business that have six-year associate degrees or have certification programs and then an ability to at least vie for jobs. These are ways of actually building in not only all this mindset and all these skills, but also showing kids, young adults, a career path to um, a good job with decent benefits. So we have to work together in, in kind of worker circles to be able to make sure that kids see this from junior high school to high school and that business actually sees that they have kids or young adults who can start at a job day one. In some ways, what government should be doing, and I know this is the next question, is that government should be taking over some of the training costs that businesses now have to pay. And if we did through these kind of partnerships, it would actually reduce the cost that business has and the cost that government should be doing in terms of public institutions. We could keep going, but we're going to try to let you take control back over here. <laughs> no, no, that's that's, fan, that's fantastic start to the conversation. And, and I don't want to interrupt, but let's build on the, the point that Randy just made, which is when we think about adaptability, critical thinking, these skills you just both talked about, do we have the institutions in place and what do those institutions need to do, whether it's government, as Randy was just talking about, or companies or unions to get us to that finish line that you're speaking about? So I, I do want to take a giant step back and be super clear that for business, talent is the dominant issue, the dominant issue. Um, and that hasn't been forever, but where we find ourselves today is this workforce that we've just talked about is the number one issue in every any conversation you have with the CEO, um, both attracting, recruiting, retaining, and developing talent. We haven't talked as much today yet about how we build a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce. And the issues that Randy so well highlighted, I think are even more exaggerated when you talk about racial diversity and frankly, gender diversity as well. And if we had more time, I would share with you some of my favorite stats around the incredible um, delta there is um, in the business community in and around the opportunities um, for our diverse, um, our diverse citizens as well. I want to focus on the things that I think business can do, which is we have to be, and I appreciate the comments around the role of government, Randy, but I do believe where we are today is that business has to invest in helping with a robust and early pipeline in skill and curriculum and career path development um, across a really broad set of the talent pool and not just sort of how we historically think about you know, in my industry, about four-year colleges, how we invest in helping think about curriculum, and then putting that not only in conversation, but into action. And I certainly know that our foundation, um, which I, I have the privilege of chairing, is really focused on how we drive STEM um, curriculum and agendas all the way down to junior high. So mm -hmm. those are, that's just a quick example as well as some of how I and we have been thinking about this topic. 
So I would say that this is a great way of unions in business and public education, K through higher ed, um, to collaborate together. And, and so, you know, part of the Build Back Better um, initiative is to create some of the funding opportunities in order to do these kind of things. But I would add one of the stats that's really surprising to anyone who hasn't heard it is that the modern career and tech ed schools, 95% of kids graduate. And we're talking about majority um, black and Hispanic graduates going into lots of different um, industries from apprenticeship programs to coding, to cybersecurity, to the food industry. So this is not your granddad's CTE. This is not your granddad's folk ed schools. This is a way that business and, and, and unions and public education can really cooperate and back map to make sure that kids who have a sense of what they wanna do and how to thrive, the skills and knowledge that they need. So what government can do, like with the Perkins money, with the apprenticeship monies, they can help facilitate. They can help make sure the matches are done. But Janet is quite right. We need to make sure that um, that 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 um, businesses know that there's talent out there, just to mold that talent and to go as far as early as we can in terms of high school and junior high school. Well, I appreciate both those answers and thank you so much for your time this afternoon. This has been a very fast 10 minutes, but a, a really great conversation. And I want to thank you both for, for joining us this afternoon. And I hope everybody has a terrific afternoon the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks so much.